Hello everyone, this is Ross Raddy and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk all about fruits, vegetables, how to grow that, how to use that in the kitchen, um, real interesting rare fruits, things you didn't think you know you could do. So let's get into it. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is just kind of what's going on in current times uh, with my orchard and the garden. Um, it's now February 6th, so uh, we have been starting seeds. Things have really started to come up. So I, we talked about seeds now on the YouTube channel. We talked about what you guys need to start the seeds. We talked about uh, planting the seeds and which seeds I'm going to be planting now versus later, how that's all going to work out. We also have a video coming out, I think in a day or two, talking about what the seeds look like now. It's been about seven days later since we started seeding um, and things are already really kicking, putting out their true leaves. Um, I couldn't believe how far along these seedlings are this year. It really has to do with the lights. Um, I really do believe that the, uh, the seedlings last year and the fig cuttings the prior year really just didn't perform very well in the grow closet. And I think a lot of that has is attributed this year to the lights. Um, we've also got the environment really well worked out, um, really high temperatures. And because things are working out so well, some of the things I talked about in the playlist here that we've created on YouTube, the 250 days of gardening playlist, which is going to talk about really from day one of my season to 250 days later. It's really starting now. Um, but we're really going to be mentioning um, in this playlist, probably in a couple days, something new I'm going to do because I've seen so much good success that why not start some seedlings in um, in like 72 to 128 cells, right? And you can get these trays that have that many numbers of them. They're, they're probably about like an inch by an inch and two inches deep. And they're not really going to be the healthy, well, not the healthiest, but the the craziest biggest plants right but they're going to be small enough so that it's easy to transplant them out and I figured why not instead of direct seeding like I was going to do a lot of the brassicas a lot of the cool loving crops like peas you know different things that you could start indoors I wasn't going to put the effort in but I think now I am because of how easy this is going to be or this is becoming um with these lights. I mean, everything is just growing like crazy. So what I'll do is I'll take the those big trays of 128 different cells, I'll seed that, and then I'm gonna take those trays once they germinate, and I'm gonna stick them in the sunroom. And the sunroom has that natural light. I don't have to necessarily worry about them hardening off nearly as much. Um, it's really great if I would have a greenhouse that was had some room in it. Um, the current greenhouse just has no room. It's filled with all these fig trees, so it's not really something that I can I can make space for. But this, you know, it kind of does the same thing, right? With the with that number of light, is that the sunroom gets that those day hours, so that when you transplant them outside, there's not so much of a of a need to harden them off as much because the sunlight's already there. You kind of have to worry about the humidity at that point. But if you're you know, growing them in a low humidity environment like the sunroom is, everything should work out really, really well. And then I'll have a, you know, an even better start to the season that way of starting all my peas and brassicas. And I'm even going to start some other things that I wasn't in originally intentionally, uh, I wasn't originally going to intentionally start. So I'm really excited. I really am. Um, so pay attention to that playlist, guys, for more to come. Um, we also have the fig winterization playlist, and there's a couple videos that are going to go in here as well. So uh, we're pretty much all the way at the end now at this point of how to overwinter your fig trees. But, you know, this is a great one to check out. I wanted to remind you guys of the same thing with the rooting figs playlist. We're constantly adding new trees to this. I've had an incredible success, excuse me, guys, of late. And I want to show you guys some photos. Look at this. I mean, look at these cuttings that are just doing so well. We've closed the door, really increased the temperatures. We've fed them. We got rid of a lot of the fungus gnats and we, um, the lights, it really is, man. These lights have just 
just done a number on some of these trees and I'm expecting a lot of them to be somewhere around three feet tall come May. Um, and that's when I'll, I'll bring them outside full time. Um, some other things I want to talk about in this video is what to me makes a great fig. And we've done a video that is going to come out in a couple days that is going to be based around this whole this whole uh, process that I'm going to mention here. Um, essentially what I'm coming to the conclusion of is that I should try to quantify certain things. Um, we certainly should be keeping track of more things that have hard data to make more informed decisions on what fig varieties I want to keep and which ones I want to get rid of. Rather than basing everything uh, off of feeling, I think feeling is certainly, in your intuition, I think that's certainly something we need to have. We don't want to forget about that. But we also want to quantify as much as we can. And I've come up with an overall rating scheme that I'm going to be implementing this year that every fig that I have tasted and grown is going to get an overall rating. And it's going to obviously fluctuate from year to year, but over the years we'll form some really nice data, um, really nice percentages so that people can make informed decisions. So in that video that I'm talking about that's going to come out in a couple days here, we're going to break this down even further, but I've actually made some upgrades and updates to the whole process since that video. Um, we originally started out with productivity, we started out with uh, flavor, and we, we talked about earliness. Those are my three main criteria for determining a great fig in my climate. You know, productivity being how many of them you eat, earliness being how early in the season they are for me because my season's so short, and the flavor being how good the fig actually is, right? It's not just enough to have a lot of them, but you also want to have figs that taste great. So... We've taken this a bit further, like I said, and we, we've added another category here called unique or standout characteristics. And these are really what that is. Uh, based off of intuition, I can give extra points and award that to those varieties that I think for whatever reason are unique or have some kind of something about them that really makes them shine. We've also changed the earliness category to something called average quality. I think the quality versus quantity is really, really important when determining a high quality fig um, or a fig that you're going to keep, right? Um, so the average quality, we've even changed the way that we've figured this out. We've still kept an earliness, right? We're taking into account how early the fig is, the, the window of the fig, right? So the first fig to the last fig. We're also considering something that I think is really important, which not a lot of people consider. It's called hang time. And that's what I call it. But hang time is essentially the amount of days it takes for that fig to be ripe. So uh, after the fig starts to swell, how many days later will I pick it? Right? Something like LSU Champagne is one that really doesn't take a whole lot of days to, to ripe. So it takes about four to five days after it starts to swell, get larger, turn color. And I can be satisfied at that point. Right? Same thing with Violette de Bordeaux and Ron de Bordeaux. Um, you know, there's only a handful of them that I could really pick so early and be and be happy. Whereas others I have like White Triana that takes maybe 10 or 11 or 12 days. Um, even Suwati, the same thing. There's so many of them that take that longer time. And in that longer time, there's a lot of rain that could happen, a lot of spoilage, a lot of pest pressure, a lot of, you know, different things could attack it, take it. Um, so I'm awarding bonus points to those that have that quality that can just don't have to hang as long as the time. Um, also considering rain resistance because even though something like Suwati and White Triana have to hang for a long time, they're superior in terms of rain resistance. They can hang out there in pouring rain and just be totally fine. I've had incredible quality figs off of those, those, two, um, those two varieties in pouring rain or after a pouring rain. So, you know, there's a whole lot of things to consider here. And that's certainly what average quality is. Hang time, earliness, rain resistance. Um, and I'm also adding in there uniqueness or standout traits. So that's sort of it. We've uh, 
those are the main that's the main thing we changed with uh, the qualities that I'm looking for another one another big quality that I think is overlooked that I want to mention here is in within the flavor and the texture of any food that you eat is extremely important not just the flavor you know the skin color the skin um, the skin thickness is also extremely important within figs right a thicker skin you're not going to get as much flavor it's going to be in the way it's going to be intrusive it's not going to be something you want to eat so a thinner skin is something I'm looking for but within the texture of the fig something that's really important is something called achenes and I've talked about these very briefly and they're essentially the the female part of the fig because a fig is an inside out flower it's a synconium the female part there that comes out and there's many of them depending on the variety there could be more of them there could be less of them the female part could be longer shorter and in some of them almost seem non-existent well this is really what determines the texture of the fig um, I'm sure there's other de there's other determinants here but for me that's like the biggest part of it um, is these achenes, the female part of the fig. And depending on how large they are, you could get something like that's more juicy, more meaty, that could feel like you're eating more of a fig. The less of them there are, and the smaller they are, the more non-existent they are, it seems like you're eating more on the texture of something like jam. That's really close to jam. So for me, um, that's something I'm really interested in, is finding out what varieties have a smaller achenes or, or fewer of them to make more better informed decisions on flavor. Something like Blanche de Duce Cezanne, this variety here, has the closest texture to jam of any fig I've ever eaten. So um, it's really highly valued for that for me. Uh, it's also one that I haven't really got that many to eat so we'll see how this one changes over time. Another one that's really highly respected in that regard is Col de Dom Blanc or any of the Col de Doms. They have very few achenes, very small achenes, and it almost seems non-existent. And they form a gooey, jammy texture that to me re resembles a lot something like um, pancake batter um, in terms of texture, like something really thick, which is, ah, uh, it's just really amazing in your mouth. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is citrus. We talked a little bit about citrus last week, about cold hardy citrus. We've done some research. We found some really nice, interesting things out. It seems like yuzu as well as trifoliate orange, which are the two main, the two main s citrus uh, varieties that I was really um, interested in, they're not really going to be the best answer for someone like me. It seems like trifoliate orange is really the only one that will survive in zone 7, even zone 6. Um, but that is really only used for certain culinary uses that I personally will not be you know, going into that endeavor. Um, and they're not really the most palatable things. Um, <laughs> so it's great if you want some citrus in your property. I think I will certainly at some point plant one. Um, you know, just to have it and say I've got it and um, probably to use it for, you know, a certain purpose, but it's not something I'm going to be using all the time in my cooking. Like, um, we've had some really interesting food that I've been making recently and you can see right here, here's some homemade tacos that my girlfriend and I made. I prepared the fish, as you can see here with the onions, really came out beautifully. We had some, uh, cumin in there, salt and pepper olive oil the fish was incredible combine that with the homemade tortilla here um, with the cilantro the avocado we also had some more sauerkraut styled kimchi that really made it have some zest and some sourness and all this acidity came together combined with the the lemon here and the point I'm trying to make is that I've just used so much citrus in my cooking nowadays that it just would be great to have something like this to then include anytime I wanted in the cooking that I'm I'm using. Citrus is just phenomenal as well as any other acidic source like onions, the whole allium family, garlic, chives, all of that. Um, even cilantro, I feel like, is adding a little bit of that. It just really is, when it comes together, it just blows, it just blows my mind, guys. So what someone linked to me, I, I'm not, I'm blanking on the the, per, the name of the person who who sent this link to me, 
but uh, it, throughout my research, this is what came up. And there's a guy, I think he's somewhere in a decently cold place, somewhere in zone 8. And he is growing these citrus trees, Mackenzie Farms here, mackenzie-farms.com. And he's got all these different varieties that he has trialed over the years. And these are the ones that he recommends. And he actually lists the, the hardiness rating of some of these. So Owari Satsuma, 10 degree tangerine, tangerine, the Yuzu, right? And he's got all these different varieties here. I was surprised to see there were so many of them. This one he says the Thomasville Citrans Quat. I can't. I can't, I didn't pronounce that right. I'm sorry, guys. But this one he says is hardy to five degrees, so that's really really cool. He also mentions here the bitter lemon, known as trifoliate orange, and that's hardy. He says to negative five degrees Fahrenheit. So really really cool that some of these are existing, and to see that a lot of these guys are not only existing but they're becoming something that's more popular. People are breeding these. There's a lot of crazy people out there like me who are obsessed with citrus and are willing to go to crazy lengths to try to grow citrus in their yards and are breeding them and are coming out with, I know a guy, he messaged me, he's got 20,000 seedlings that he's growing somewhere in Pennsylvania. 20,000 seedlings planted in Pennsylvania's own 6A to try to get, or 6B I think he said, to try to get some variety of hardy citrus and then expand on those from there which is incredible here's one that seems a bit interesting is citrange and this is a um, a hybrid between sweet oranges and trifoliate orange very cold hardy grow and produce fruit where other cit citrus trees fail hardy zero degrees fahrenheit so this could be one that i would try i think this is the one that i would probably try first out of all of them um, it's showing the best hardiness as well as some other characteristics that may be um, just a bit better off for cooking. So I may do some more research on this and come to a better decision. But as of right now, I've decided instead to kind of up my citrus game in containers because if I can't grow them in the ground, I'm going to grow them in containers. I'm, I'm, I've already been going through the gauntlet of growing citrus. They're very difficult to kind of take care of. And get them through the winter time there's some definite definite tricks and things rules that you should live by that I've kind of learned um, you know you can put them in a cooler area in the house you know somewhere around 50 degrees they'll pretty much stop growing uh, which is good but at that time you don't want to make sure that you're you want to make sure that you're not watering too much because if you water too much they're very prone to root rot. A lot of these citrus trees, some varieties are even more prone to like dropping their entire default, like they defoliate completely. Um, some of these trees just really have some problems with these cooler temperatures. So for them to be in an extended period of time where they're at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you really have to take care of them and make sure you're not over watering, giving them a nice little climate as best as you can. For me, I'm going to try to put them in a warmer place, right? I'm going to put them in a warm window somewhere around 70 degrees I think is a really good temperature for them to actually grow and maybe even potentially help them ripen their fruit that they will have over the winter time and then that way um, you can water them a little bit more they're a bit less finicky that way with those added temperatures the sunlight from a south facing or west facing window you know feed them as much as I can and they should perform really well um, you know, I've had, like I said, a number of different citrus trees over the years. I've, had, I've started out with limes and lemons and, and kumquats, and I didn't really find them too valuable. I was really interested in growing cara cara navel oranges, which are very sweet, really interesting flavor, as well as blood oranges. You know, even the cuties, right, the, the satsuma mandarins, all those things I found more interesting than something that was a bit more sour. Well, the sour fruits of citrus are so much easier to grow they're more forgiving in that way right they really need certain temperatures certain heat units to really get that sweetness in the fruit so you know the limes the lemons the the kumquats don't really care too much about that and you they're more forgiving that way um so that's what i'm actually going back to and believe it or not i had a citrus tree i had uh a kumquat tree where I got to have some citrus off of that. I've had a, a lime tree where I got my own limes, but 
I didn't see the value in it back then. I'm really kicking myself for getting rid of those trees because now we're going back. And Four Winds Growers seems to be the really most credible source for these citrus trees um, online, at least in an online nursery setting that is willing to ship as well to Pennsylvania. Um, I know Just Fruits and Exotics takes their citrus very seriously, but they're not legally allowed to ship anything outside of Florida in terms of citrus because of the greening. So for me on their website here on Four Winds, I've gone through a number of different varieties and I've figured out that these are gonna be, I think, better choices for me. The Eustace Lime Quatri, which is a cross between a Mexican key lime and a kumquat, I think this is probably a better choice than a lime. Um, you can be used like a lime, but it kind of behaves more like a, a kumquat, right? It kind of looks more like a kumquat to me, right? The the skin's actually yellow, like a like a uh, a lemon. So I think this one may have a bit more uses and might be a bit more productive, right? It says it's ever bearing, highly productive. Um, it sounds like to me a complete winner in terms of getting a lime that I could use for cooking, using that juice, maybe even using the peel for something. Um, you never know; the peel may even be a bit sweet. So pretty cool. Um, the next one is the Australian finger lime, and this one's super popular. It's becoming super popular. It is like off the charts, uh, something that everybody raves about. So it's got these little lime vesicles, right, that pop out like caviar. You squeeze it, and it kind of pops out and even apparently pops out in your mouth a little bit and really adds different textures, different flavors. It's really a weird, interesting type of lime that um, – it's just really exciting. Um, it's even a smaller fruit, which probably means it's a bit more productive, less energy that needs to go into that. Um, and then there's the Fukushu kumquat tree. And this one is highly regarded as the most tasty. It's also the largest kumquat that's widely available. It's also very hardy. Um, I've just heard really great things about this. And kumquats are that fruit that... A lot of us haven't really experienced unless you're more experienced with probably more Asian cultures, maybe even Middle Eastern cultures. But um, this is a fruit that you eat the whole thing. And me, really stupidly, when I first started out and had a kumquat tree and had kumquats off my own tree, I decided to peel the kumquat, not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> so you can... Um, obviously peel it it's not easy but the inside's so sour that i was like oh my god this is the most sour thing i've ever eaten i was amazed that something existed in nature that was that sour but the peel is the sweet part and the combination between the peel and the interior provides a really nice snack and the cool thing about these is that they kind of bloom in the fall or they bloom in i think they i think my friend said they bloom in the winter Ah, I can't remember now. It's it's been a it's been a while since I talked to him, but essentially what I'm thinking is going to happen and how it works out in terms of the blooming and the harvesting is that these kumquat trees are going to be harvestable in the early spring. So I'm going to have them out sometime in in May and June, and I imagine that I'll be harvesting lots of kumquats off my tree, which really makes this a winner. Um, and I should maybe even invest in more kumquat trees because if they're if they're producing fruit at that time of the year, that's as early as it gets in terms of fruit for me. You know, you have this long break throughout the winter, and that's kind of what citrus does. It really gives you that fruit throughout the winter time and even in the early spring, so that you have that nice little source of nutrients. Um, but for us here in colder climates, we don't get that right. We don't have that luxury to grow citrus all year unless, of course, you're growing them in containers. But there's also other fall fruits or winter fruits like loquats that, you know, could kind of fill that gap for a lot of you guys out there in warmer places. So this is going to be a really nice thing, I think, to get something that could potentially even ripen earlier than, say, my strawberries, right? My June bearing strawberries are the, the first thing of the year ripening in late May. And I love them damn things. And there really are something amazing 
to get them that early in the season and especially at the quality that they are it's incredible so i'm thinking that the kumquats could fill an even earlier gap than the the strawberries and i could be eating fruit all throughout may and that would be really really something so that kind of concludes this episode of fruit talk guys i hope you enjoyed this one you know we talked all about the different playlists that i mentioned in the beginning we talked about what makes a great fig cold hardy citrus and the citrus that i'm going to be growing here um you know in this upcoming season in containers so thank you all for watching if you enjoyed this one follow me on facebook instagram and twitter because we post things like this here this uh this taco here this fish taco we talk all about this and what went into this that i normally don't mention here in my videos or the podcast even though we did today um also check out um you know my patreon please subscribe guys on youtube give this video a thumbs up you know any any support at all is really highly recommend or highly uh, appreciated and uh i thank you guys for everything that you guys have done um happy to share the knowledge that i have so Take care, everyone, and uh, I'll catch you all for tomorrow's video, and I'll see you next week for next week's podcast. Take care.